So, so welcome, welcome everyone. Um, my, my name is Joel Darvos. I'm a senior fellow at Google, <coughs> and I'm very pleased to chair this event today on reforming the fiscal rules. And as you can see, this, is, this might look like a, another Franco-German in initiative, but apparently, uh, actually, it was not. Uh, the two <coughs> uh, councils of the, of, the, of the two countries started to work on similar issues completely independently from each other, and we have just, uh, you know, incidentally learned that, that the other group is also working on the same topic. Uh, so that's why we sought to organize a joint event um, where we will launch both reports, as, as you're certainly aware, uh, <coughs> from the introduction of or in invitation to this event. Uh, the two reports look at the current European Union fiscal framework, uh, assess its, its properties, um, and, uh, well, I think I will <coughs> not reveal any secret if I, if I already say that both reports find that there are major problems with the, with the current framework and make proposals on, on how to improve it. And what was also interesting also to learn, even for, for us, that <coughs> the conclusions of the two reports uh, are very similar in a number of aspects. There are certain differences which are, which are important and, and have to be discussed, but the main issue is that the two reports reach broadly similar conclusions. Um, <coughs> I have to say that I personally also contributed to one of the reports, the, the French report, but here I'm sitting in the middle as a chair of this event and I will act as a chair and not as an author. Uh, <coughs> so let me briefly introduce the, the, the authors and the, and the two discussants for which we are very thankful that they, they share their, their time and, and thoughts with us. So first, the two speakers, we have Lars Feld, who is from the German Council of Economic Experts, and, and Philippe Martin uh, from the <coughs> French uh, Council of Economic Analysis. And we have two really prominent discussants from two European institutions, again in alphabetic order, uh, Lucio Penck, who is the director um <coughs> at uh, the DG Actin on Fiscal Policies at the European Commission, and Beatrice uh, Pierre Luigi, who is the head of the fiscal section at the ECB. So I'm really hoping to have a very exciting discussion. So I first ask the two, two authors to give their initial presentations in no more than 15 minutes, and, and I will try to be very tough on time. Uh, and then we invite the two discussants, and then we will open the floor for questions and comments. And I very much hope that we will have a very lively and interactive discussion, discussion between you and the panelists. So we go in alphabetic order, so we start with, with, with Lars. Yeah, thank you very much. They told me that, that they're going to change the sound. Do you hear me? Well, otherwise I'm going to speak up a bit more. Um, well, actually, uh, I don't want to, to be, uh, want to talk too long. Um, I want to be brief in order to have a discussion among us and a, among us and a discussion with you. Um, the uh, paper is now launched at the Vox EU. Uh, the short paper is launched at the Vox EU homepage, and uh, there is a, a larger, a broader background paper that you can find on uh, the webpage of the German Council of Economic Experts. Also, now in, in these minutes, uh, it has been up uploaded a few minutes ago. Um, you can reread everything there. So I just want to uh, focus on uh, the main uh, differences we see with respect to the current uh, fiscal rules, uh, the fiscal framework in the European Union. Um, and uh, I think during the discussion also the commonalities and the differences between uh, both councils are, are going to show up and we can discuss that further. Um, what we wanted to uh, achieve is um, to have a proposal which is a little bit um, less complicated than what we already have. Um, well, I need the slides, so, I, I, so if you just change it. Uh, thank you. Um, we want to have uh, rules, or we want to arrive at a reform of the fiscal framework that uh, provides us with um, uh, less complicated rules, at least um, as, as far as we can go. Um, and the rationale for that is quite easy. When, when I'm going through um, uh, my country and give presentations on the current situation in the European Union, uh, and I'm talking about uh, the, the fiscal situation, uh, the, the GDP ratios, and how the different countries look like, 
someone in the audience is always saying um, nobody is really, take, uh, is, is really um, taking care of these rules. They are always broke. Uh, it's always a big problem. And I try to explain to these people that only the 3% and the 60% that are very well perceived in the general public are insufficient to find out uh, what these rules actually make and whether a country complies with it or not. Um, I usually try to pr provoke my audiences by saying uh, the framework is meanwhile so complicated that it's very difficult not to comply with it. <laughs> That's the problem. And this is something we would like to address. Uh, the second point is um, we have the impression that we can also uh, support that by uh, some empirical evidence, and I think the French Council has done that uh, in, the same, uh, in a similar way or with, with uh, other evidence. Um, the current uh, fiscal rules uh, largely uh, work uh, pro-cyclically, and that's, this is one uh, additional problem that we have to face. Um, on the other hand, uh, when we uh, think about a fiscal framework, um, it is difficult to change it without treaty changes. So this is also something that um, we have to keep in mind. Um, when you think about the literature about fiscal rules, uh, you want fiscal rules on the one side that precisely target the fiscal aggregates you are interested in. So it's not useful to have uh, broad measures that are addressed. Um, these aggregates must be under the direct control of governments. They should be uh, forecast reliably. And uh, there shouldn't be so many revisions uh, to, uh, to those estimates or to, to those figures that you have. Uh, the procyclicality is the problem that I just mentioned. Um, in the end, you want uh, to achieve a reduction in the debt to GDP ratios because we still think that uh, the excessive indebtedness in many member countries of the European Monetary Union uh, provide for a problem if there is another adverse shock uh, for uh, the area. So the reduction in the debt to GDP ratios is very important. And finally, uh, there must be political costs for non-compliance, otherwise it will not work. So this is uh, some of uh, the, the basic um, uh, things we want to address. So when you look at this framework, um, what we propose is actually a shift of emphasis in the um, current fiscal framework by putting an expenditure rule um, for the, as a short-term objective or short-term control uh, in the first place, and having the structural balance rule only um, followed in the medium term as a, as a complement, as a second element of this fiscal framework. So we simply uh, shift the two uh, different parts of the current fiscal framework uh, from, the, from the basic orientation. That's uh, what we would like to achieve. And in addition, um, we want to have uh, something that helps us to reduce the debt to GDP ratios. This is uh, formulated in general what we would like to achieve. So regarding uh, the expenditure rule that we are uh, looking at, that we are proposing, uh, we propose to have an annual target constraining the growth of expenditures. Um, actually, this uh, is not fixed numerically, but we say uh, let uh, nominal expenditures including uh, some correction for inflation, I'm going to make a remark on that in a minute, uh, take nominal expenditure growth along a five-year or ten-year average of um, the um, uh, potential, um, uh, potential GDP from the past. So either you look at the growth rates of uh, potential GDP uh, across a five-year average or a 10-year average, and then the expenditure growth uh, that you are targeting should be uh, like that. Um, we don't take the full uh, expenditure. We must have a correction for inflation. Um, we are not very uh, strict or... Um, yeah, problematic in what you take, whether you take the consumer price index or uh, the GDP deflator or the inflation target of the ECB, we are open to any of these proposals. But some correction must be uh, in order to have uh, actually control or a check for real expenditure growth in the end. Um, we want to have um, an expenditure growth or expenditure figures that are corrected for uh, some cyclical element. In the background paper, we conduct an analysis showing that on the spending side, 
the most volatile um, element is unemployment uh, spending, spending for unemployment. Um, and actually, the revenue side is much more uh, um, affected by cyclical influence than uh, the spending side of budget is. Uh, and unemployment spending is the most volatile that you can find. So we, we should control for, uh, sh we should deduct cyclical unemployment spending. Um, when we look at the current figures or the current framework, um, in the medium term expenditure that exists, uh, the member countries can already um, uh, correct for cyclical unemployment, but they can do it without any harmonization how this is done. So they do it on their own, individually, with uh, uh, the uh, uh, calculation capacity of the different member states. And we should, uh, according to our proposal, also exclude interest spending. So, of course, this is not a structural primary balance idea, but uh, something of that can be found in, in spending as well. And spending is much more important uh, than uh, the structural balance in the short term because it can be much more easily controlled by the government. Uh, that is the uh, main advantage that we have on uh, the spending side. We also have the advantage that uh, we find something that is uh, much more independent from the business cycle than the structural uh, balance. Um, and what you can also demonstrate with data from the past, the forecast errors are uh, a bit smaller, well, substantially smaller, actually. Uh, so we, you get something that is largely acyclical uh, and allow automatic stabilizers uh, to work. Um, in the medium term, we would like to uh, keep the structural deficit rule, so we don't want to abolish it fully. We acknowledge that it's difficult to calculate um, the, um, uh, to make a structural adjustment, but still um, we think that it's important to have this medium-term restriction. So in a medium term, we think that the figures you might have for um, the output gap uh, are less prone to revision than uh, the real-time uh, estimates for the output gap, and therefore we think uh, when you uh, continue with this type of fiscal rule in the future, as a medium-term target, uh, it will work much better than uh, the current system that we have. Um, and in order to uh, address the potential revisions, the potential mistakes that occur in these estimates, we propose a multipurpose adjustment account. This is a multipurpose adjustment account in the following sense. On the one side, um, on the one side, the uh, mistakes you make regarding uh, the expenditure rule are taken into, into account here. Also, the mistakes you make with respect to the structural deficit. We also have some revenue estimates that must be uh, considered. There can also there also some mistakes can occur. And finally, also uh, the uh, extent to which a country uh, exceeds uh, the expenditure rule or the structural deficit rule. Uh, in its realizations of the budget, um, uh, these are also accounted for in such an adjustment account. And the adjustment account uh, is uh, symmetric in the sense that um, it reduces the amount of spending that is possible if there is a deficit accounted in this adjustment account and it um, relaxes the restrictions on the spending rule, on the expenditure rule, if there is uh, a surplus in this adjustment account. So. Uh, this is something uh, that we take into account here. We want uh, finally have a debt correction that is also um, uh, well that is also linked that is uh, have, has a connection to the expenditure rule in the sense that uh, countries that have a, a higher debt to GDP ratio than a certain threshold, we take the 60 percent of the stability and growth pact. Of course, this is uh, a figure that is taken. You can also have other figures lower ones or even a bit higher ones, but this is political decision. We take the 60% because it is there. Um, and then we make um, uh, a discount on the expenditure growth that is possible in, this, uh, in the different years. So this is also something that we take into account. We have some simulations in the paper uh, for, um, different, um, for different discount values um, um, calculated that debt reduction by 150th or by 175th. And uh, uh, these are the two simulations that you can look at in the paper. Actually, um, the country that is aside, um, Greece, uh, has the highest debt-to-GDP ratio is Italy. 
And with a, a one-fifth reduction, we are, I think, at about 34 years of 36 years um, until the debt to GDP ratio is below the 60%. So uh, also, this correction is not um, too strong and too restrictive uh, for the different member countries, but in the end, it is restricting something. So here is somehow the uh, summary of all that um, with the annual expenditure rule. You have this benchmark, you must be below, uh, below it, and you have, in addition to that, a debt, debt correction and a multi-purpose adjustment account. What is making the current um, framework very complicated are the different exemptions and sanctions. The exemptions is quite complicated in the sense that there are too many, and this is um, the... Uh, Far, the most far-reaching uh, proposal in our um, most far-reaching element in our proposal, we want to abolish the exemptions uh, and only leave two: one for uh, natural catastrophes and another one for very severe economic downturns. So these two uh, should prevail, and uh, we would uh, um, eliminate all the others. Uh, regarding sanctions. Of course, we are sure that the automatic sanctions are difficult to uh, arrive at. Um, in these must be democratic decisions in the end, so you cannot really uh, give independent bodies the full uh, decision-making power on that. Um, but uh, at least you can increase uh, the um, automaticity, to, so to speak, of uh, this framework. Uh, by, uh, on the one side, strengthening national or the, uh, the national or the European fiscal councils, um, by, on the one side, reforming them, giving them more independence than they currently have. This also holds for the EFB. And on the other side, if they are more independent, gives, give them uh, more uh, possibilities to suggest uh, a sanction for one of the member countries or for its own member country in the case of, a national, of the national councils, uh, and then propose something to arrive at a better outcome. But you could also say um, that, the commission will, uh, that the Commission should have less discretion in imposing the sanctions. Uh, um, originally, we, had, um, we, we, we do not only have this high, the highest level of sanction that could be proposed, we should also have a lower threshold that uh, you cannot below, that you cannot go below this lower threshold in imposing the sanctions. So a, a sanction of 0% should not be possible in our view. Either you have a sanction or not, and then it should have, have a positive value. Uh, so um, I think I, I, I conclude here, and uh, I have eaten up a bit more than my 50 minutes there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. It was <coughs> exactly 15, so you are just, just perfectly on time. So let me now pass the floor to, 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 to Philip. I think there are many similarities. Maybe you might not wish to motivate the same thing, but highlight what is similar and perhaps what are, what are the differences uh, between both the motivation and, and the recommendations. Thanks uh, to, uh, to Burger to organize this, uh, this, uh, this meeting. And indeed, uh, Lars made my uh, life a little bit easier because indeed you'll see that uh, some of the proposals we make are relatively similar to, to, to what the German Council uh, is doing. And again, I insist that uh, it was completely independent, so I find it uh, quite extraordinary that our two councils, in some sense, converge uh, more or less at the same time and uh, around the, the same uh, proposals. So this is indeed a, 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 a paper uh, that is co-authored with uh, Salt and, uh, and, and Xavier Rago. So let me uh, uh, go a bit fast on, on some issues which is uh, on the rationale for fiscal rules. Let me just uh, um, spend one minute on, uh, the fa on the reason why we, I think, need, uh, we still need some uh, fiscal rules for, uh, for the euro area. Uh, and that puts the focus on, on the issue of debt, not, not deficits. At the end, I think the reason why uh, we need uh, uh, these rules for the, uh, the Eurozone, for a monetary union, is the fact that if you have a fiscal crisis in a monetary union, the cost, the collateral damage on the others is so huge that uh, that means that uh, the creditor countries, the other countries, uh, will have to step in and to make transfers, or it will have... Uh, uh, a, a huge pressure on the ECB, and therefore, uh, there's, that's the nature of the spillover. That's the reason why I think we need uh, common agreed uh, uh, rules, fiscal rules at the, at the Eurozone. Um, now, what the fiscal rule should be, and in a sense, it's a way to think about the criticism 
uh, on the present rules because we think that uh, the rules are not uh, they do not have these three uh, 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 advantages. Uh, and here it's very similar to to uh, to what was uh, uh, just said. They should be simple and transparent. Uh, they should be stabilizing in the sense of countercyclical. Uh, in fiscal stance, and they should be effective, obviously, in reducing uh, uh, debt for countries which have excessive <laughs> debt and therefore ensure sustainability of, uh, of public debt. Uh, so one observation we make, and from that point of view, I think we completely agree uh, with, with you, is the huge complexity of the present rules. Uh, I defy you to, to explain them to, uh, to anybody. I uh, completely failed when I try uh, in front of my students. Uh, so, so it's a problem because uh, if um, members of the parliament, ministers, the general public is completely unable to understand these bureaucratic rules, I think we have a democratic problem. And that means there will be no political ownership of, uh, of, uh, of these rules. And so that, I think, is a big, uh, is a big problem. Uh, the second thing, and indeed, again, I think we, we share this concern uh, with the German Council, is, uh, is the measurement issues. Uh, the rules are very much uh, uh, focused uh, on the structural budget balance. Uh, that's that's the key uh, the, the key parameter that uh, is driving the rule. And uh, what uh, what we show, and this is uh, following some work that uh, that was done here at, at Bruegel by by Scholz in particular, is that uh, in fact this structural balance is often uh, very often. Uh, uh, revised, uh, the average absolute revision from one year to another of the structural balance is around 0 0.5, 0.6% for, for core countries. So it's huge. And that means that these discussions don't make much economic sense. Just uh, uh, right now, uh, there's a discussion between the, the, the French government and the European Commission. The French government says the structural effort that I'm going to do next year is uh, plus 0 0.1. And the Commission says, no, it's zero. Uh, next year, it will be uh, plus 0 0.6 or minus 0 0.6. So basically, this, discuss, this discussion makes no sense from an economic point of view. And centering uh, and, and focusing and, and basing uh, policy decisions and policy recommendations and sanctions uh, on, on this type of discussion is, 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 I think, meaningless. So, And from that point of view here, we go further than the, the German Council because uh, uh, we, we, we do away uh, completely with uh, this uh, structural uh, uh, budget balance. That doesn't mean that we will not uh, want to, to, to analyze them, to, uh, to try to make an estimate, but I don't think that they should drive uh, policy decisions or policy recommendations. Uh, they are indeed pro-cyclical. This is something, again, that, that we share uh, with, with you. And uh, there has been a big problem of non-compliance uh, with, uh, with the rules. Many countries were put into excessive uh, deficit procedures, uh, but in fact, uh, a few have been, uh, and there's been no sanctions uh, for, for this. On sanctions, I'll come back to this. Clearly, uh, we, we are not in favor of automatic sanctions. Uh, because we think that this bureaucratic rule uh, uh, that is automatically uh, put into place, I think, is a big problem and, in fact, is not credible. I don't believe, I, do, I believe that automatic sanctions will not be credible anyway. Uh, so anything which is not credible, I think, is not uh, super useful. So the, the proposal that we make on this expenditure rule from that point of view, again, is, uh, is similar to, to, to the German one. So, and in a sense, OK, let me try to, if I was trying to, uh, to, to explain it to my, uh, my grandmother or my children, I would say uh, that, uh, that uh, basically the idea is that you cannot uh, spend more than what your uh, income is uh, at the end. So nominal expenditures should not grow faster than long-term nominal income. And in fact, they should grow at a slower rate huh, for countries which have excessive debt. In a sense, you know, and that's, that's the, 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 the crux of the, of, the, of the rule, and it's a relatively simple and intuitive uh, way to, to explain it. Let me be honest, of course, it's a little bit more complex than that, but the, 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 the core of the argument is this one, and I, I think it's relatively simple to explain to politicians, to the main public, etc. and I think that's important for, for ownership. So the main advantage, one, is simplicity. There's less measurement issues, so it's not based on, on the output gap. Uh, and, and so it is going to be uh, 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 linked to, to potential uh, growth. But what we know is that the revisions or the mistakes that we make on potential growth are much smaller 
uh, 10 times basically smaller than on output gap and therefore on the structural deficit. So the mistakes we'll make, yes, of course, we, we are going to make mistakes, but uh, they are uh, smaller of, by, by one order of magnitude. That's, that's really important. Uh, and public expenditures are, are indeed uh, directly observable in real time and directly controlled by the government. So again, in terms of political ownership, that's uh, much better than the structural deficit that, uh, that the government obviously does not control uh, directly. It's less post-cyclical, uh, so basically the idea is, is a stabilization of expenditures of the, of, the, of the cycle. That's one way to think of it, about it. Um, it's in nominal terms, and that's important because that's another uh, element of uh, counter-cyclical uh, uh, nature of the, the rule. The reason is that basically, uh, if you have a, a negative demand shock, for example, that means that the, uh, the, the inflation rate is lower than what you expected, and that means that in real terms, the real growth of expenditure will be higher uh, uh, than uh, what was uh, uh, in, the, in the rule at the, uh, expected, at least. So, so there's an increase in the real growth of expenditure during a recession and vice versa. Let me be honest, of course, that works for demand shocks. That works less well huh, for, uh, for, for supply shocks. Um, but our view is that uh, most of the, the shocks in the Eurozone are demand shocks, and that therefore that's, uh, that's the reason. Uh, I'm just coming back on, on the issue of inflation. We had a lot of discussions on what is the inflation rate, and here I think we would need a lot of uh, help from, uh, from the ECB, and I encourage, of course, the ECB to work and, and help us in terms of the simulations. We're not completely uh, stabilized on uh, what should be the inflation rate. Uh, basically, it should be the, the certainly the, I think we agree on, on more on the, the producer uh, uh, in, uh, inflation, uh, the, the price, uh, producer price in, uh, index. Uh, the ECB 2% uh, rate, I think, is a bit of a problem because just think of what happened two or three years ago. It would mean a huge uh, ex fiscal expansion like two years ago, because uh, when the inflation rate was zero and uh, you put a infl nominal inflation rate at 2%, you have a huge increase in expenditure. That's fine. If the German Council is in favor of a huge fiscal expansion, uh, uh, that, that's fine. But just have that in mind that uh, when the ECB has trouble to reach the 2% inflation rate, that, that generates automatically uh, a large fiscal expansion and vice versa. Uh, if, uh, so, so I think we have to be a bit uh, uh, careful on that. And again, I think we need more work uh, to be clear on, on that, on, on the, the nature of the inflation uh, uh, put into this. But, but it has good... Uh, it has a, a good uh, uh, impact on, on the counter-cyclical effect. And indeed, we exclude cyclical unemployment spending. Okay? So uh, even though we are not uh, uh, advocating a mathematical rule, clearly when we do the simulations, we need uh, some, some mathematical rule. So here it is. And basically, uh, the growth rate of expenditure for each country and for each time is going to depend on real potential growth which has to be, uh, uh, and here this is the role of uh, the National Fiscal Council, the Independent F National Fiscal Council, uh, which has to be estimated by this uh, National Fiscal Council. Independent, it has to have more means, more power than, uh, than it has uh, right now. And I'm talking about my own country especially, uh, where, where there's clearly a problem, I think, on the National Independent Fiscal Council. Expected inflation, we talked about it. And then the debt break, and here, Basically, the debt break clearly is going to have a target of reducing debt. Uh, uh, so, so basically, you, re you, 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 uh, you have a lower uh, uh, growth rate of expenditures for those uh, countries which are above D star, and D star here is the 60% uh, long-term target. Uh, and basically, here, the idea that we have, and here I think we depart maybe a little bit from, uh, from, uh, from your proposal, is that um, governments have to have a, a five-year target of reduction of uh, their debt-to-GDP ratio. This, and this is more, made more precise in, in the paper, this, uh, there's a proposal by the government. It is discussed and assessed by the National Fiscal Council and the European Fiscal Council, saying it's uh, ambitious enough or it's not ambitious enough. Then the commission has a discussion with the government. The commission will say it's ambitious enough, it's not ambitious enough, and at the end, it's a proposal to the council. And so basically, that's where the discussion between each government 
and its other partners has to make. So basically, uh, there is a commitment by each government to say 2%, 3%, 4%. Obviously, a, a country that has high debt that comes up and says 1% in the next five years, that's not going to be ambitious enough, and that's not going to be acceptable and accepted. So basically here, for example, in the, in the, um, in the simulations I'm showing, uh, we're taking the, 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 the target that uh, the French government has given itself, which is a reduction of debt to GDP ratio in the next five years of five percentage point. Okay? We, can, we can discuss whether it's ambitious enough or not, but, but anyway, that's, uh, that's basically the nature, uh, the nature of the rule. Okay. And so it could be different for different countries. Like for countries which have higher levels of debt, uh, you would want to be uh, maybe more ambitious. Okay. Uh, so we, we do some counterfactuals. So this is work done uh, by uh, uh, OFCE, uh, where uh, here, I'm sorry, uh, we, we, we're focusing on the, the French case. Huh? So here in, uh, in dark blue, you have the gross rate of uh, uh, primary public spending in, uh, in France, which was the observed one. And then the other ones are uh, the ones that uh, would be implied by, uh, by the fiscal rule for different, uh, 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 different uh, estimates of the potential growth rate. The important thing is that you see that even with uh, differences in potential growth rate, the implied growth rate of expenditure is more or less the same. It's not identical, so indeed we, we, we would make mistakes, but not that, uh, that large. The important uh, message of this graph is that for France, you see that uh, the observed growth rate of expenditure was pretty high during the, the good years, so it was procyclical, and uh, pretty low during the bad years, during in particular 2011, 2013. And so what we have here is that in fact, in this, in, with the, um, the, the proposed rule, we would have much less growth in terms of uh, uh, expenditures during good years, this is exactly what you want, and more during, uh, during, uh, during bad years, so it is indeed more countercyclical. The same thing on fiscal impulse, huh? the fiscal impulse would have been negative during the good years in France, and positive or, or, or low uh, during, uh, during, uh, during, uh, during the bad years. Okay? Uh, so again, we go uh, in, in fa we, we favor uh, independent uh, national uh, fiscal council. They are important in particular to provide estimates huh, uh, for, for uh, the potential growth and the expected inflation, uh, and to say, basically, uh, whether or not the government is complying uh, with, uh, with the rule, along with the, the European uh, Fiscal Council. Last thing, uh, rec we, we do recommend some uh, sticks and carrots, so in terms of how the enforcement of the rule. I don't think we have uh, a, a, um, uh, a, you know, a, a, a rule that, uh, or um, solutions which are perfect solutions in terms of enforcement, but one of them is in terms of carrots, is basically that uh, we want uh, uh, that, um, uh, the, the, to make the, the access to, for example, a flexible ESM, EFM credit line and participation in a potential euro area uh, fiscal stabilization instrument to make it conditional on the compliance uh, with the fiscal rule. And then the last thing is a recommendation in case of non-compliance with the fiscal rule. Uh, we recommend to increase the political cost of, uh, of indeed not complying, in particular uh, with some comply or explain procedures for the Ministry of Finance, not only in front of the national parliament, but also in front of the European parliament. The, the Ministry of Finance would be obliged to go in front of the European parliament to uh, 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 explain, uh, comply or explain. We have other uh, uh, compliance uh, procedures. Uh, we, we, uh, we do not put it at, uh, as a recommendation, but this is linked to, for example, some of the things we've said in the 7 plus 7 uh, uh, report where we to were talking about, for example, uh, 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 junior bonds, uh, where we issue junior bonds uh, to uh, finance expen uh, expenditure, which is, uh, which is excessive. And I should, I guess, uh, stop here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Philippe, very, very much. Indeed, it's very nice to see that the two proposals have many, many commonalities, also some differences. So now let's see what, what the representatives of the two institutions would, would tell us. Again, let's, let's go in alphabetic order. So, so Lucio? I think, uh, yeah, even too loud, perhaps, but uh, I've been told that the sound would be regulated from, uh, from the center. So, and here I have a few 
few slides, so if they can, many thanks for inviting me, and these are a set of, I would say, paper presenting interesting uh, uh, important similarities, as I'm saying, has already been uh, noted, and uh, which reflect, I would say, the evolution of the reflection on, on, on fiscal rules. So, these papers do not come out of nothing. They may have to be coordinated, but there is a common background, let's say, in the reflection over the past uh, few years. And there are also some differences which, uh, in my view, highlight uh, some important and possibly neglected issue in the functioning of fiscal rule, going beyond issue of design, uh, especially at the supranational level. So for this reason, I would uh, uh, divide my discussion in two parts, one on the design and the other on implementation. And let me say one point head on. I think as economists or policy practitioners, we sometimes, let me put this way, fall into the trap of getting enamored of some elegant design, spending a lot of time to find the best design. And I think uh, we also in the commission, in the fin at least, they were not immune for that. But I've become more and more convinced that to some extent the problem may be deeper and perhaps more difficult to solve for this respect. But I will try to explain. So when we look at this, I say me and my collaborator, as these two papers, we call the similarity. And basically the way I would characterize them are two variation or species in the broader genus of what I call state-of-the-art fiscal rule. Why I say that? Because in the literature there has been a number of similar proposals. I would like to quote, uh, uh, I think because it's one of the very first, it's not the first uh, paper in this direction, by my colleague Nicolas Carnot, a rule of the thumb, was very much based on the same concept. Then the IMF has uh, written abundantly about second generation smart fiscal rule and so on and so forth. And what do I mean by that? And here I just go to the structure. All these rules recognize, and that's the point on which also I would signal my intellectual agreement, that the ultimate objective must be debt reduction. So that's what we call a debt anchor. And the two papers are on this line. Uh, here I try to highlight the differences in that. Uh, it seems to me, perhaps I, I may have missed uh, some of, 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 of the detail in a reading which is, was relatively quick, that the German paper here, the initial of the author, seems to want uh, to uh, design uh, this debt anchor, the debt reduction to me, according to some kind of fixed rule. The French paper seems to allow for some more discretionality. We heard about the process, which is, uh, uh, okay, involves both the national and so some kind of more discretionality. But, okay, I think the, the topic is, the, the, the issue, the approach is very much uh, uh, similar. Then, and this perhaps is the point that I would like to stress most uh, as a point of consensus also on our part, and this was said rather eloquently in the two presentations, the two papers agree, and I would agree with them, that the operational instrument, I mean, the ultimate goal is debt reduction, but you cannot target directly debt for a number of reasons that need not repeat in. The most suitable operational instrument is some constraint on the growth of primary expenditure. And there, let me say, I will not uh, dwell on the reason because they've been expounded very clearly here. Just also make that another point. I mean, this concept was, to the best of my knowledge, pioneer in the six-pack proposal of the Commission because the proposal are essentially the copy carbon of the expenditure benchmark. Then you can quibble about uh, the definition of inflation, the calculation on unemployment. Incidentally, we have rules also for that. It's not completely arbitrary. But this idea, you go for exp primary expenditure because essentially is the variable that is supposed to be under the control of the government. We would agree very much with that, and in fact, uh, is very much uh, within, is very much in the EU framework. You may say it is more complicated, but is in the EU framework since uh, the, the, the six-pack, uh, at least, uh, under the name expenditure benchmark. 
Then there is a point that perhaps is less important, but nevertheless on which I would like to attract your attention. In our conceptual characterization, the one that's on the left side of the slide, okay, you have the, the ultimate objective, debt reduction, the instrument, expenditure, fully agreed that should be parameter expenditure. Then we see a place, conceptually at least, conceptually at least, for an intermediate objective in terms of deficit level. And here I have just two short remarks. The German proposal, in my view, uh, it may, I'm, I'm sure that the mathematics are right in the end, but conceptually seems to border on the side of overdetermination of the system. In a sense, you have the debt reduction, you say expenditure, but then at some point the close to balance pops up. Now, conceptually, this is wrong. I mean, mathematically, because if you, let's say, for a given, I think this is rather banal, so I will not insist, but for a given macroeconomic scenario, for a given, uh, for a given uh, 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 macroeconomic scenario and a given debt reduction target, there is a unique set, I mean, ex ante, of course, we know that ex post things, it is a, new, a unique set of deficit level that will satisfy the, and then the expenditure benchmark will have to be designed, I mean, calculated, consistent with this set. So, it may be that just by happy coincidence, these deficit levels are close to balance or not. So that's why I speak over determination, having this close to balance popping up. My personal suspicion is that knowing a bit, having known pretty well the history of the debate, there is an attachment on the German side on the concept of the big zero. So somehow <laughs> you have to menage, as the French would say. And so although it is conceptually redundant, in fact potentially contradictory, the close to balance has to appear at some point. So in this respect, I would, uh, I would uh, agree, but uh, with the, the point, the analogous point that I think has been made by, by, uh, by our French colleague, except that perhaps my criticism of the other paper is that it's completely silent on the fact that there will be some level of deficit. And this level of deficit, some visibility will have, I believe. So this is more of a conceptual point, because the point is completely ignored, but we know that, uh, I mean, uh, there is not a unique expenditure. It depends on where you are. Your primary deficit starting point is. This will tell you, so more of a conceptual point, which kind of expenditure. There is not a unique expenditure rule. There is rather a set of deficit. Uh, Finally, okay, this is just describes how we see the intermediate, the, 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 the role of the intermediate of the intermediate target. Uh, so conceptually, we believe that this would be the, the, the most, uh, uh, how should I put, complete, uh, 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 complete uh, representation. Then there is a final point, which I think is rather important. It's uh, even if we agree on all these points, and I think there is a broad agreement uh, uh, among us, you have a legitimate question about the setting, or if you wish, the resetting of the expenditure growth. Uh, both papers, if I read them correctly, seem to argue for an annual setting of expenditure. Although, especially in the case of the French paper, there is this idea of the, of the multi-annual. In turn, the annual setting is linked to, in different ways, to some sort of adjustment account. The idea being that overshooting are compensated in the following year. Just let me point that uh, this, a possible criticism, not a fundamental one, uh, is one of potential pro-cyclicality. So let me give an example. Suppose that in the first year, the government has manage to achieve the expenditure growth. So I make it simple, I make a, a simple case. However, I mean, the macroeconomic scenario turn out differently. The balance will be very different from what you expected. The structural balance, and we know how volatile, as we said, has been very different. At least the reading of the paper suggests that in the following year, to some extent, policy should be more restrictive. I'm not sure that whether I would like this type of approach. Let me suggest an alternative approach. One could think of a multi-annual expenditure target binding for the government. In this way, the concept, the, the purpose of the 
adjustment account in a sense would be implicitly incorporated because if you stick, if the target is binding, in some year you will spend less, in other year you will be spent more. And I mean, if there is a certain symmetry over time, over a medium term, uh, provided that you stick to the expenditure rule, inevitable, you would have it and you would avoid some kind of short term, uh, potentially procyclical reaction. Let me stress in this respect that this is not uh, an idea that I have formulated for the purpose of this discussion. This is very much uh, the idea that you find in the Commission proposal for the incorporation of the fiscal compact in new law. Uh, I think this Commission proposal have not uh, received much, uh, have received some attention by the, the experts, let's say. Uh, it's fair to say that uh, the reaction on the part of member states uh, has not been very encouraging. Uh, so let me, in this case, use this opportunity also to attract the attention that there is, in fact, an official commission position that goes very much, incorporates very much this framework. And I think uh, not just for the sake of publicity of our work, but for the sake of the debate, it could be usefully uh, uh, taken on board. Let now me move, let me move on the other part which is conceptually a one on which economists have spent less time, in a sense, because it's not uh, the problem of uh, okay, finding an elegant, uh, uh, parsimonious uh, uh, design of fiscal rule. But arguably, it's the most difficult issue to tackle at all. I mean, we call it here the trilemma of your fiscal rule. Uh, we will expound uh, on that, on a Vox column that is going to be published next Friday. I mean, by, I'm one of the co-authors together with Nicola Carnot, Gilles Moore, and Servas de Rose. And basically we say, there is a, well, a recognized trade-off between simplicity, having some simple rule that everybody understands, and adaptability to economic circumstances. And Okay, we all think that we, are, we all agree that we are not at the frontier. I mean, there is a bit of a trade-off. I mean, some rules are very simple, but you know, counterproductive. The moment you want to take into account the economic situation, then you risk losing simplicity. But, and here is the crucial point, in a sense, rules, EU fiscal rules, are not just meant to be indicative bench benchmark. They are meant to be enforced on sovereign. And typically, <laughs> The issue of enforcement arises when it is less convenient for the sovereign to respect them. So the political cost of compliance imply that there will be a very strong pressure to show that the relevant circumstances have been taken into account in order to avoid ostensibly irrational outcome that in turn would detract mm, from the what is the solution of this? I mean, there is one solution, I think is the principal solution, is to have an authority to achieve the sufficient degree of granularity, so to speak, is to have an authority that basically decides where, how the rule should be interpreted in the case of a time. But in the EU, even more than national level, what is the problem? There is not such single authority. We are in a system of multi-level governance in terms of legal, even strictly speaking, because you know there are competences of the Commission and the Council. But even more politically, there is not a recognized single authority which is generally acknowledged to be able to adjudicate on this issue. So what is the alternative approach? The alternative approach is to finesse the rule in order to cater for different economic circumstances. And this is what we have been, as called, the the quest for the complete contract, and as the name suggests, is going to be an elusive quest. And I think this is a bit the history of EU rule. And I am afraid, and here I come to the conclusion, that the two proposals may not provide, this is really a conundrum to which the two proposals may not provide the definite answer. That is, let me say, they go in the right direction. To some extent, I, I am bound to say, <laughs> they also reflect some ideas, or indeed even formal proposals that have been put forward uh, by, by, by the Commission or, let's say, uh, economists in DG ECFIN. My suspicion is that it were put in practice, they may lose some of the appealing simplicity in their presentation. And here you see some potential issues that maybe 
that may, uh, 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 that may arise. And uh, in particular, and then when we come to the implementation, my suspicion is that in the case of the German proposal, there is too much of a reliance of algorithm, because one of our reactions, discussing my colleague, was, well, after all, I mean, if I understand, this is not less complicated, arguably even more complicated than the, the preventive arm of the stability of growth pack in its initial formulation. <laughs> and where I should stress, I mean, uh, italics added to initial. <laughs> so my suspicion would be that in the contact with reality, your proposal would result in the elaboration of some sub rules to, to cater for some unforeseen circumstances. Uh, the French proposal, in a sense, seems to recognize this, in the sense that at different stages, it gives more role to discretion or economic judgment, if you want. But there, the problem is the who has the authority, the, rec the generally recognized authority to make this judgment. And I think uh, this is a very, uh, it is a very uh, fundamental problem. A point on, a last point, and here I conclude on enforcement. Here again, I, the German proposal, not surprisingly, uh, relies a lot on automaticity, so to speak. I suspect my experience suggests me that in the political economy of the EU, automaticity may, find, may, may go against some very difficult time consistency problem. I mean, we have tried to do it to some extent, and uh, we know how things uh, pan out. Now, there is an answer, of course, uh, of course. Uh, yes, but the locus of decision was wrong is the politicized commission between, quote, let's have an independent, uh, truly acknowledged independent fiscal council. Again, my suspicion is that uh, giving more a role for an independent authority, say, in place of the commission, would uh, shift the locus of the political haggling but not so much the outcome. And anyway, I don't want to conclude on a negative <laughs> note. I say the proposal, I believe they go very much in terms of design in a direction that I would share. I simply suspect that reality may be still more difficult than the problem described in the proposal. Thank you, <coughs> Thank you very much, much Lucio, both, both for the specific comments to both papers and also for the more more general uh, issues that, that you very well highlighted. I'm sure the two authors would, would have many, many, many comments to respond. But let's first hear what Beatrice would, would like to tell us. I take the... Thank you. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Todd, for inviting me to this very important debate. And uh, thank you very much for the presenters for these excellent and very clear presentations. Oops. Uh, so I'm disappointing you because I'm speaking in my personal capacity, not, uh, so my views are not necessarily those of the ECB. Um, so we start. <laughs> 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 Good. So we start with the uh, notable probably to move. Okay, yes. Um, still, I thought, despite I'm speaking in my personal capacity, to have a couple of points on why this debate is very important for monetary policy, and I think the, the French paper uh, did it very, very well in that in that respect. So we have a no bailout clause, but. We are seeing an accumulation of high debt in several countries, and of course, this increases the risk of fiscal dominance and the sovereign bank nexus. We know that activism in fiscal policy may endanger the synchronization of business cycle synchronization, and this uh, also is problematic for the transmission mechanism. We also know that spillovers and contagion from bank policies are particularly strong in EMU. And also, uh, last but not least, building buffer in good times basically reduces the risk of procyclical policies in bad times. And this implies that then the concept of aggregate stance in bad or very bad times becomes relevant when the monetary policy is constrained at the effective lower band. Um, so um, where the problem lies, um, actually, it's not obvious if you look at the euro area as a whole. So the euro area as a whole looks very 
much, much better, I would say, compared to other advanced economies in terms of budget balance position and also government debt. And uh, so from an outsider's perspective, the euro area is OK. But OK, we have large cross-country differences within the euro area. And this is uh, the second chart that I show. So you see that uh, my presentation is a bit more on data <laughs> than on what. And the second chart shows the heterogeneity across countries. Here I take the estimate for 2018 uh, of the Spring Commission. And uh, so these are estimates, but they actually uh, the incoming data shows that this estimate uh, could are quite accurate. And uh, we could even be surprised on having better deficit figures, actually, for 2018. So actually, so you see a lot of heterogeneity in terms of deficit and debt. We don't have, I think, a deficit problem, because uh, many countries are in surplus, many more than Germany. Many, a number of countries are close to balance, and a few have a deficit that is between 2 and 3, 2 and 3% 2 and 2.5%. There is a problem of debt in some countries. Uh, that is higher than 80% of GDP in a number of countries in the euro area. And what is problematic, <coughs> and this is the chart, if I may, what is problematic is that these high debt countries are those uh, with um, what I call the largest uh, fiscal shortfall. So the distance to the medium term object is very high. These are the red countries uh, where, in the, where the debt is high, and the debt are the, the blue dots. And this is a problem, and this is, um, can be attributed to the working of or non working of the rules, but this is clearly a vulnerability. And it is a vulnerability, as the two presenters were saying, because there is a risk that in the next recession, the, the red countries will need to do procyclical tightening, because there is no, <laughs> no choice. And the procyclical, uh, procyclicality of uh, fiscal policies, again, very much mentioned by the two presenters, is something that we know very well about. So this chart shows um, five-year averages of output gap and change in the primary structural balance. And then basically you see that in the five year of boom, <laughs> we had uh, pro-cyclical loosening. In the five year or, uh, yes, of um, recession, we had uh, pro-cyclical tightening. And now, now it's not clear, but now this data are in real time, so there can be revision. So now uh, going to the two papers, uh, why uh, the, the European fiscal framework needs to be changed. And here, yeah, uh, blue is, is France and yellow is Germany. Um, so uh, the paper uh, mentioned many points. I, I listed six points. It's too complex. Uh, in particular, the German paper emphasizes that there are too many exceptions and escape clauses. The, 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 ru the rules are leading to procyclicality. In my reading, this was more, more emphasized in the French paper than in the German one, but in the presentation, actually, uh, the German also emphasized this, this problem. There are very large measurement problems, and, uh, and then basically rules are not enforced and they are not complied with. And basically, how far we should go, and uh, the French paper called for a major overhaul, so we get rid of the structural balance. This is not needed. And we sideline also the 3% deficit limit. This was my reading of the paper. While the German one um, called for limited reforms, we don't touch basically anything and we keep the structural balance as a medium-term target. So indeed, they have many things in common, these two papers. They are consistent with the U treaty. They want to keep the debt anchor at 60%, and they uh, propose an operational target. Uh, so I use target, but I should have used instrument. And, uh, and this, is, uh, this operational instrument is the change in nominal primary expenditure, net of unemployment spending, or the cyclical component of it, and uh, net of new discretionary revenue measure. This is the, what I call Delta G star. And um, they also uh, call for escape clauses for exceptional circumstances only, so getting rid of, rid of all these uh, uh, many flexibilities. And we can say that on this concept, that also was emphasized by Lucio, there is uh, basically a, a commonality of views uh, in an increasing number of studies, so uh, that's fine. 
And uh, of course, this delta G star compared to the structural balance is under con has a lot of benefits because it's under control of the government, it's easy to communicate, it's simple to measure. And here, yeah, I would have some doubt because uh, uh, when you include these new discretionary revenue measures in our G star uh, measure, this is, I think, not so easy to estimate ex ante and probably even ex post. What are the differences? So uh, you will see that my discussion focuses more on the differences rather than on the commonalities. And uh, in the working of the rule, so apologies, I have, uh, I tried to put the, your rule in a formula in the, the way I understood it, your papers, and uh, I have to apologize because I only read the, the summary German paper, not the, the, full, the full paper. So I might miss something. So the first proposal, the, the rule was already shown by uh, Philip. Um, so uh, we have, we have uh, uh, our G star, delta G star, that move in line with long-term um, potential output, expected inflation, and uh, a debt adjustment factor, which is country-specific. And uh, while the German uh, rule is, is composed by three elements, some in up to three elements, and uh, these three elements are, again, these uh, long-term uh, growth and expected inflation. And then this debt adjustment mechanism and the multipurpose account that enters in the rule while in the French proposal I understood is uh, outside the rule. So the first difference is the sign. One is an equality and one is a minor. Um, OK, so we go on. The second difference is that uh, in the French proposal, I understood it was time varying, and in the German, I read it as constant over time. However, in the presentation, it was clarified that it actually can be five year or 10 year long averages. So. And then uh, let's look at this debt adjustment mechanism, the way I read it. So um, it was explained that in the French proposal, it's not based on a formula, but on economic analysis. It is country specific, and then there is, it's consistent with this five year moving uh, debt reduction. While my reading of the debt adjustment mechanism is that this is actually a structural balance rule. So the structural balance depends on the debt adjustment. Uh, uh, yes, so we have a, a, a structural balance rule which depends on, on a constant, which is my medium term objective, it can be zero five deficit, or it can be zero plus a debt adjustment uh, uh, mechanism. And then we have this multi-purpose uh, adjustment account. So the two accounts are very different. One is very uh, small, so it's just the deviation between actual and um, budgeted spending. The other one contains all possible deviation you can think of. So it's the deviation from the, stru the structural balance rule, is the exposed revisions compared to the ex ante measurement of the stretch balance, the structural balance the estimation uh, error in the discretionary revenue measures, etc. So a bit more complicated. Oops, I have only three minutes. So um, here I have a slide showing my understanding, pardon, no, I'm going too fast, uh, um, the <laughs> my understanding of this uh, debt adjustment mechanism embedded in the structural balance of the German proposal. And the way I see it, and I recompute it, this is much stronger than the actual current debt rule. So my question is, because the debt rule has never been enforced so far, how can you credibly enforce this kind of debt adjustment mechanism with, with your proposal? So going to the differences, for the differences, this is on the enforcement. And basically, uh, here the French paper is much more elaborated than the German one. I'm, I'm listing uh, the the three, uh, mm, the three uh, mm, types of enforcement proposed, positive incentives, sanction, compliant, explain, and you see in the tick that the French is certainly more, much more elaborated, and the German focuses a lot on the automaticity of sanction. And then uh, on the governance, also I believe the French is a bit more elaborated in terms of what uh, we should do to to make it work, and in particular, this idea of home ownership of the rule is very much stressed. Um, now, I have uh, listed some questions for, for you, and I have actually three questions each. 
Um, so for the first question to the German is why you have a, a minor in your, in your formula, because for me, the debt feedback mechanism and the multipurpose account already take care of uh, convergence to the NTO, but on top you have a, a, a minor sign. And then also, I was wondering about the countercyclicality property of the rule. This is a point that was also made by Lucio. And then I could not find anything on what happens to the preventive arm, because in my reading of uh, the current work of the rule is that uh, it is much easier to comply with the corrective arm than with the preventive arm, because with the corrective arm, you just follow the nominal, de the nominal deficit, reduction, uh, deficit reduction strategies. So, a view on that would be interesting. On the French proposal, again, three questions. Uh, same as uh, Lucio, multi-annual or annual expenditure uh, rule. And then also the idea of the intermediate target comes back here because is inter I would like to know how long it takes to reach a budget balance with your rule, given that it's a bit missed, the, 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 the intermediate target that uh, uh, Lucio was describing. And the final, the final point is on this idea of economic analysis that maybe becomes, at, at the end, too much of discretion. And instead of having this five-year debt reduction target, you, you end up with just a debt, a, a moving target. So the use of, of discretion. So I'm summing up, so I'm done. Uh, this is an important debate, which I think is very important and has to complement the ongoing discussion on the fiscal stabilization function. There are important common messages. I'm not going to list them, because as have been already said. The differences seem to partly reflect national preferences, automaticity versus discretion, uniformity of rule versus a lot of country dimension, an encompassing rule versus trying to simplify. And then I had also a question for the German one, is because uh, the, 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 the French paper brings about the idea of using uh, mm, more market discipline, and this has not brought about in the German paper, so I wanted to you, uh, hear your views on that. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, Beatrice. Uh, uh, first of all, for giving a, a very clear overview why this issue is important for, for a central bank and what are the current issues in the, in the euro area, and also in particular for your very detailed analysis and comparison of the, of the two proposals and, uh, and the many, many questions that you raised. Now, since time is running, uh, I would now would like to open the floor for questions and comments. I, I suggest we collect a number of questions and comments. You could raise questions to anyone, even, even to the discussants if you wish. Uh, I would like to ask you to first in introduce yourself and try to be as brief as possible because uh, time is indeed running, and we would like the panelists to, to have the time to, to, to answer. So the gentleman here, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Javier Dov. I am a member of the European Economic and Social Committee and a Spanish trade unionist. I, I'd like to put two questions to Mr. Fell. I understand your concerns to establish rules that enforce fiscal discipline of governments. But it is not a fact that it is so, or perhaps more worrisome for the German and uh, European economy and societies that the annual net rate of gross formation of public capital of Germany is practically, is negative, practically, from the beginning of the 21th century, as we have recently seen in an excellent article in the block of this foundation written by Gunther Wolf and Alexander Roth. And the second question is relation. Has the uh, German Council of Economic Experts said something about this problem, the problem of the deficit, deficit of the uh, investment in Germany? Of course, public, but also private uh, investment. Thanks. Uh, Martin Leich, Secretariat of the European Fiscal Board. Uh, two very short questions. Uh, both uh, proposals assign important roles to uh, independent national fiscal councils. 
with a provisio that they need to be stronger. Now, do you think that this can be achieved uh, in a relatively short period of time? And how would you address the almost uh, physical force that Lucho Bank has described, that political pressure would always move where decisions are taken? The second, uh, also related to national fiscal councils, with the decentralization that I think both of you um, put uh, on the table, how would you see the role of coordination uh, costs and possible um, uh, divergences of views between, let's say, the independent assessor at the European level and uh, at the national level, also in view of the, uh, of the spillovers that you both uh, highlighted. So how, how would you actually ensure that uh, national fiscal councils who may not take into account uh, necessarily the impact on, um, on the euro area level that they actually do take into account this, um, this spillovers. Thank you. Uh, yes, hello, Gabriel Giudic from the European Commission. Um, you made uh, both the case uh, uh, that there is a debt anchor and the debt uh, sustainability is the starting point, uh, and then you focus on one important controllable uh, policy level, which is uh, primary expenditure. Uh, that's more or less also what we are doing, as uh, Lucio just explained. Um, I still think that, however, we have an issue with the partial equilibrium approach, which is looking too much at some aspects of fiscal policy and not looking at the full picture. Uh, in particular, you take for granted or as exogenous three m other elements besides uh, primary expenditure, which are very important for uh, sustainability, which is uh, GDP growth, which is uh, implicit liabilities, and the third is tax policy. Now, not looking at that, I think in the first place it underestimates the ongoing fiscal effort at European level. If you look at the number of countries and Beatrice uh, sh showed before the evolution of debt to GDP, but it doesn't show, for example, the number of countries in Europe, in particular those with high debt, explicit high debt levels, have done very si significant reforms on the implicit liability side through pension reforms and healthcare reforms. Very important. So first of all, it is underestimating what we're doing, and I think in Europe we've done a lot, in particular in the countries with very uh, significant debts. Uh, second, I think from a political economy point of view, uh, when the government is deciding what to do in the budget, it has to look at these four elements at the same time. What is doing for growth, what is doing to address implicit liabilities, is a major political issue, what is doing taxation, and how to spend the rest of the budget. So in your policy prescription component, so the focus on primary expenditure is looking at that. But when a government is sitting together and taking the decision in, in October and in November on what to put forward, it has to make a balance between all these four elements. And looking at the giving incentives only the primary balance might not be sufficient. So I don't know whether you are thinking about these other things and whether it's possible to bring the rest of the picture uh, inside the discussion. Thanks. Then let me let me give back the floor to the to the to the two two speakers. So we received questions on on public investment. Perhaps you could also explore whether how it would be incorporated into the fiscal rule because ultimately this is the topic of, of the day. Then on independent fiscal councils, uh, is it feasible? <coughs> um, coordination costs uh, and on looking at the narrow picture or a big picture. So um, Lars, let's start with you and then yes. Philip here. Yeah, thank you very much. I'll try to summarize or structure my reply uh, by taking up several of these uh, remarks. So first of all, the question on automaticity and uh, sanctions. Um, well, uh, in general, the rule that we are proposing has more automatic elements um, regarding uh, the, uh, the, the debt correction and the expenditure growth uh, that we want to introduce, we don't give discretion to the government in that regard, in contrast to 
uh, the proposal by uh, our French colleagues. So this is more automaticity, so to speak. Um, uh, in general, we want to reduce the extent of discretion uh, in the different elements that we are proposing. Um, and therefore, uh, what is very important in our view is to uh, do away with, with many of the exceptions and escape clauses that are included in the current framework. Um, regarding automaticity of sanctions, we are a bit more reluctant. When you please also read the background paper on that, first of all, we are not deci uh, decided um, in saying it is the National Fiscal Council's and, and necessarily a decentralization in that regard that needs to decide on something. It could also be the European Fiscal Board. Uh, the precondition that we are uh, asking for is a much stronger factual independence, not only legal, which is also can also be improved on, but also factual in the sense that they are able to conduct the analyses uh, that you are proposing uh, more directly and, and more explicitly in your, uh, in your proposal. But um, we are also fully aware that what you say, political haggling, is then uh, put on uh, these fiscal boards, either the national fiscal boards or the European fiscal board. And um, when we had the change in uh, one of the changes in the current fiscal framework a few years ago, I don't know when it was, what is it, a six pack or whatever, I, I, I get lost in all these changes. But uh, there was uh, the change that uh, was ensuring that you need to have a positive majority in the council in order to, um, uh, to, to, to override the decision uh, that was done before or the override uh, by the commission, by the, uh, of, of the proposal by the commission. And this was a six pack, okay. Uh, and I was, um, when we discussed that uh, during that time, the six pack was uh, um, decided upon. Uh, I had argued in the council that then in this political economy game that is going on, the pressure will be put much more strongly on the commission. And what actually we observe that. Is we have a political commission in that sense now. And I would also expect that uh, when the European Fiscal Board uh, decides much, has to decide much more or the national fiscal boards have to decide much more. So I don't think that we can have a full automaticity of sanctions, but at least in contrast to what we currently have, we should have a corridor of sanctions. Uh, there must be a minimum and a maximum, and not only the maximum. So actually, in the current situation, you can even say you have a negative sanction, no? in the sense that uh, you are subsidizing uh, the government, which, ha which, is having, uh, which is not fully complying with the rules. This is still possible. No? So uh, I would, well, I'm overstating this case, but you see what I wanted to make here. The second point is, is this overdetermined? Well, actually, it is not, because um, what we are saying is you have this short-term um, goal, which is expenditure growth, and this is annual expenditure growth. You have the intermediate target. You also have to comply with the structural balance, and you have the debt correction in order to achieve, um, have an additional, an additional element that brings us closer to reduce debt-to-GDP ratio. So you have a sequence from the short term to the long term goal by also introducing an intermediate target. Uh, Lucio, in your uh, alternative proposal, you, you do similar things. You only have the multi annual expenditure uh, target that you are proposing there. You also want to have something um, intermediate that, that ensures uh, that this uh, long way from short term targets to the reduction of the debt-to-GDP ratio of the highest uh, indebted, uh, indebted countries, which takes 30 years, you want to have some intermediate uh, um, uh, target as well uh, in order to have another feedback on that. Of course, you could say, why, don't you, why do you, in addition to that, also include the adjustment account, which is also a kind of medium-term um, feedback uh, for several things. Well, actually, in any of these uh, steps that we are taking, mistakes can still happen uh, regarding the calculations that we do. Uh, and therefore, the multi-annual adjustment account is very important. Um, and you also have the correction for uh, the deviations from the different um, uh, fiscal rules that are um, uh, included in, in our framework. 
which is also quite important. So I would not say, um, in particular, in a political economy um, situation, that we have an overdetermination of the whole system. Yeah? That's the, se the second point I would like to emphasize here in the, in the different discussions that um, we had uh, by our two discussants. And I think, well, the t the we have tested the countercyclicality. Regarding the corrective arm, and well, we get uh, a much smoother um, effect of fiscal policy on um, GDP growth. And third, uh, the corrective, your, your third question, the corrective arm, well, um, to some extent we leave it as it is, uh, to some extent, um, with the exception that at least we should have uh, a minimum sanction imposed um, and included in uh, the current framework. So we don't touch the excessive deficit procedure. And therefore, it's also important to continue with the structural balance rule in that sense. Yeah? So you, you, you will keep that. And then um, I would also say the necessity to have um, a treaty change in our framework is pretty low. Um, regarding the different questions, I think I have also re already replied to Martin Large uh, in, in that regard. Um, we are not decided actually, whether it is the European Fiscal Board or the National Fiscal Councils that play a stronger role. And as I said, uh, I'm much more in favor of uh, having uh, this minimum sanction. Regarding um, the uh, question of debt sustainability and the decisions of, the, of governments, well, um, in this sequence that I just described and um, relying to what Lucio was uh, doing in his uh, comment, uh, all the different um, uh, goals that the government uh, wants to look at in autumn when it finally fixes the budget for the next year, uh, this is taken into account in an, in an expenditure rule. In the expenditure rule, you have some of the expenditures that are fully bound by the uh, liabilities that become explicit every year but are implicit in the longer run. And when you make a change for these implicit liabilities, uh, this will, uh, at some point, um, in be included in your yearly uh, expenditures that you have to undertake. Um, second, I'm happy with all the calculations on, on implicit liabilities, but uh, on the other side, um, it is easier to turn back the page of a pension reform and reintroduce um, the old system uh, that some uh, part of your uh, population looks, uh, he, he, Lucio already starts to laugh. Huh? So this is the situation we have in Italy. Uh, when you look at the S2 indicator of the commission, you see that uh, that sustainability of uh, Italian fiscal uh, policies is uh, very well, but of course this very much relies on um, the continuation of this reform policy. And therefore, uh, I would also uh, stress much more uh, the annual expenditure uh, target uh, than uh, relying on uh, implicit liabilities in the longer term. Therefore, for the, li for the longer term, we have uh, the debt rule, the debt restrictions, the debt correction uh, included in our proposal. Um, and finally, let me reply to the public investment thing. Well, this is something it's difficult to uh, explain to a, a, an international audience. Uh, we are discussing this issue for several years uh, regarding uh, public investment as well as uh, private investment. And you must be um, aware of the fact that all the figures that are officially reported are heavily biased. I will explain it to you. About 40% of public investment in Germany are undertaken by the local jurisdictions. This is about 40%. Um, first of all, this is not restricted at all by uh, the debt break. The debt break restricts the deficit of the federal level and of the states, of the lender, but not at, of the local level. The fiscal rules for the local level are saying they can, be, they can run, run deficits um, at a level that is equal to public investment. So it still exists there for 40% of public investment, an investment-based um, fiscal rule, so to speak. What we observe in the past, and therefore this data is um, uh, biased, um, since the 1980s in West Germany and after unification also in East Germany, we have an outsourcing of 
local um, enterprises. They were formally counted as public enterprises and therefore uh, were part of the public sector. And then they were outsourced to the private sector, still remained at least to a larger share, a majority share, or fully in the property of those local jurisdictions. But the restraint on those newly privatized but still public enterprises were lifted to a larger extent. So you have constructions at a local level where, say, the, the former uh, power, um, uh, power, uh, um, power firm that you had is the holding of a large set of different uh, enterprises uh, held by this local jurisdiction. And of course, the former public investment is taking place in these private sector firms. And the statistics ha have never been adjusted for that. So the strong reduction that you see in public investment at a local level in Germany since the 1980s already is due to this fact, because it took part in the different states and the different communities at different points in time. Nobody took care of that in the statistics, and it's not taking care of the statistics at all. So the figures are wrong. That is very important to note. And uh, what we currently observe is uh, that the restrictions on public spending imposed by the debt break and by the fiscal compact, um, these restrictions do not um, actually apply to normal spending components. We mainly consolidate public budgets in Germany by lower interest spending and by higher revenue, but um, the spending for public consumption, public transfers, and public investment have increased considerably in the last five years. Thank you very much. Okay. to some uh, questions in the, in the room. So, Lucio, I mean, uh, one of your first comments was, uh, in some sense, all is fine because we already have these, uh, these, these rules uh, at the Commission and we love them and we implement them. Um, yes, but uh, to some extent, uh, uh, you, have, you have many other rules and in the debates and in particular in uh, some of the recommendations you make, the expenditure rule is not at the forefront. Uh, the, the, what is at the forefront is the structural uh, uh, deficit, uh, which is fine. I mean, if, if this is the, the rule you're defending, but so I would be very happy if indeed the Commission uh, puts more uh, focus on the expenditure rule. So that's that would be going towards in uh, our direction. But I, at the moment, I don't think that the focus is really on on the expenditure rule. And there are many other uh, 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 constraints in the present rules. And one of the difficulties is that it's always hard to find. Which is the binding? Uh, which is the binding one? You ask about the, uh, the intermediate objective, and in a sense, I think this was one of your question to Beatrice on, you know, the rolling, uh, uh, the rolling objective. So let me re-clarify. Re so uh, the government uh, gives a five-year objective in terms of debt reduction. This objective has to be agreed upon at the European level. Uh, the uh, National Fiscal Board, the European Fiscal Board, the Commission and the Council in a way that is described in the paper. So clearly that's, uh, that's important. And in fact, in some sense, this also responds to one of your questions. Who takes into account the spillovers? The, the, in, and that's where we say that the European Fiscal Board is important. Uh, we, we want to give more power to National Fiscal Board, but also to the European Fiscal Board, which say clearly uh, will have to assess to what extent uh, uh, the, uh, the objective in terms of debt reduction is ambitious enough to, uh, to reduce the potential negative spillovers that uh, debt overaccumulation in one country uh, would, uh, would generate. So there is this, this intermediate objective. Once you have this intermediate objective, uh, you translate it into the uh, maximum growth rate of nominal expenditures given an expected inflation, which has to be uh, uh, generated, uh, assessed by the National uh, Fiscal Board, uh, the, 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 the new discretionary measures. And I completely agree, this will be difficult, huh, on the, especially the new discretionary measures. That's, that's the estimation. Uh, but basically, it's reverse engineering. Each year, once you have the, the, the expected inflation, 
uh, and uh, the, the debt break, which has been decided on a five-year objective, that's, uh, that's kind of reverse engineering to get the maximum growth rate of uh, nominal expenditure with the, the expected in inflation. Uh, MTO, yes, we can actually, uh, depending indeed on the, uh, this, uh, this um, um, uh, debt break parameter, which itself depends on the ambition that uh, you, uh, you have on the debt uh, reduction, you can reproduce the dynamics of the MTO in terms of debt reduction. So that depends basically on uh, how much, uh, if you want to do a, a 10 percentage point G, uh, reduction in GDP in 10 years, uh, 20 years, etc. So that's going to be dependent on this, uh, uh, on this parameter. And again, this, is, this parameter has to be agreed upon uh, at the European level because this is the nature of the, the, in the spillover. Um, Okay, so, so you, you talked about implicit uh, liabilities uh, and things which are exogenous. Uh, GDP growth, actually, in our simulations is not exogenous, huh? but, uh, so, so let's, uh, let's be clear on that. Uh, but implicit, you're saying, well, in some sense, you, you need more discretion or more economic analysis because, for example, if you think of a pension reform one way or another, it is going to have an impact on uh, implicit uh, on debt in dynamics in the future. That's exactly the point that we're making. We're making the point that, indeed, uh, if, it's, if it's everything is automatic and there's no economic analysis, that's where we're going to run into trouble, where uh, governments are going to try to uh, cheat with the, 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 the statistics. And that's where we need, for example, an independent fiscal board that assesses, for example, the pension reforms. So as to say, then if you make this pension reform, that means your uh, debt reduction objective is not ambitious enough anymore because you, uh, you've made a pension reform that actually increases uh, future liability. So that's, that's the reason why we want to give more power to independent fiscal councils that take into account this type of uh, uh, implicit liabilities. Again, super difficult. I'm not saying this is easy, but clearly we have to take this, uh, to, we have to take this into account in the, the, the debt reduction uh, targets that uh, governments uh, have, uh, have set to themselves and, and, and produce in front of their uh, European counterparts. Thank you <coughs> very, very much, Philippe. Now just let me change half for 30 seconds to answer also one question by, by Martin Large on on possible coordination costs between the European and national uh, fiscal councils and, and the Commission. In fact, we, we don't want them to coordinate. We want them to make independent assessments. So the national fiscal council should do its assessment based on the best knowledge it has, and that should comp comprise of independent experts. The same should be done by the European fiscal council. And certainly we can see whether the, the two councils uh, uh, composed of independent uh, people come to similar conclusions. Most likely they should not be completely different. And then comes the commission. So ultimately the commission will make a proposal to the council based on the opinion of the two independent councils. So I would not see major issues with, with, with coordination. But now change my head back to as a chair. And my last word is to thank uh, Lars Feld, uh, Philippe Martin, Lucio Penck, and and Beatrice Pierluigi for, for sharing their very an interesting thoughts with us and for all of you for, for being here and also contributing to this debate. So thank you very much. <laughs>